In science, for instance, it's obvious that you have to be able to discuss incorrect hypotheses. You have to be able to make an incorrect hypothesis, and it's disproved ultimately. But freedom of expression and, and freedom of science requires that you be able to make such a hypothesis and experiment to see whether it's true or not. Julius Gray is a Canadian lawyer and university professor. He's a senior partner at the law firm Gray Cassegrain, S-E-N-C, and he's particularly well known for his expertise in constitutional law and human rights law. Hello, Julius. How are you? Okay, how are you? So, Julius, what do you think of free speech? Why is it something relevant? Free speech is an essential part of any type of freedom, whether in a democracy or any other type of government of law rather than an arbitrary one. Because you can't change anything unless you have freedom of expression. Freedom of expression is extremely important in order to be able to affect any type of change. And let's add something else. Freedom of expression is important to say something that's unpopular, to say something that's considered politically incorrect, to say something that people don't want to hear. There's no reason to have a rule of freedom of expression to say motherhood and apple pie to say what everybody agrees with. The purpose of freedom of expression is precisely in your face things that will make people angry. And without freedom of expression, uh, you don't have any form of democracy. One of the things about freedom of expression in our times is that control, uh, restriction of freedom of expression has been Uh, privatized to some extent. It used to be that the state, the king, the, the, the party, or anybody like that would repress freedom of expression. But right now, you also have private people censoring themselves, the platforms, the various platforms, the media themselves. There are rules that you can't hurt anybody, that you can't insult anybody, that uh, you have to accept certain basic premises of the system. And the result is that it is very, very difficult to challenge the basis of the way in which our society runs. And anybody who cares about his career, who doesn't want to be thrown out of university, thrown out of artistic endeavors, not hired, not shown, not uh, displayed, anybody who wants to have a future and who, say, is in his 20s or 30s, is going to think very carefully about what he says. And that's a lamentable uh, situation. You were talking that there has been a privatization of the censorship. Were you referring to the fact that it was more focused in the government before and now the governments are more liberal, they permit more open talk or that they haven't transitioned towards a more liberal mindset, but now are private companies the ones that censor? I'm not quite sure that the governments are more liberal. I think the governments also repress freedom of expression. I think what we live in is, I call it a totalitarian democracy where uh, the establishment controls every part of your life. You have to have the right opinions about gender, the right opinions about race. Uh, not that anybody would want to be a racist, but they have to have the right opinions about all of these things. But the enforcement is not only the government, but also private ones. And there's a problem with the situation that we have in our totalitarian democracy. That is, that in dictatorships before, Although some of these elements were present, people generally didn't believe it. In 1943 in Germany, everybody knew that there was no freedom of expression. And if you said something and you were punished and you got out of prison, you were not disgraced. In 1946, people who had been punished were praised. They were told, you know, you were a prophet of a different type of world. Whereas today, nobody believes you. Nobody says, if you're accused of something, you're presumed guilty, uh, no one will believe that you're not. Nothing is ever erased anymore because of the internet, so that if you say something and that is misinterpreted, you're uh, finished possibly for life or certainly for a very long time. So that the totalitarian democracy is in some ways more effective. It's not as brutal as the dictatorships were before, but it's inexorable. You can't get away from it. Once you have communicated a message publicly, one, that stays there forever, 
that you used not to happen before in pre-internet era. And two, the fact that not only everything said publicly will stay there, but there's not a way of correcting something you said previously. Even if it's mistakenly understood like a racist comment, you will yeah. be called racist no matter what kind of correction you yeah. do in the future. It's uh, not only uh, mistaken, if you said something mistaken, in the old days, you could either correct what you said or it could be forgotten. I'll give you an example. There's a very famous novel by Theodore Dreiser called The Financier, where the hero is speculating on the Philadelphia Stock Exchange and he's caught short and he goes to jail for five years. He gets out of jail and he goes to Chicago and he makes even more money on the Chicago Stock Exchange in a book called The Titan. Today, that would be impossible. He'd never trade anywhere again. He couldn't trade in Germany again. He couldn't, uh, you know, you can't cross the border again. Everything is recorded and everything is remembered. So there are good things about it. For instance, if you lose a document today, you, you can get it out of your computer again. There are all sorts of things that are, are perhaps very um, useful, but there are also truly totalitarian aspects of the remorseless nature of our society. Yeah, I agree. And going back to what you were mentioning before, that freedom of speech should only prevail not to defend the messages that are institutional or that are accepted by the majority, but precisely to defend those that go against the majority. Freedom yes. of speech is freedom of speech to criticize the powerful. Yes. And, and to say the unpopular things and to criticize the society, to say, I don't like this country. I don't like our army. I don't approve of what we're doing. And that can get people very upset. Yeah. I think that freedom of speech is the only method that we have to autocorrect. When you don't have that, there's nothing left. There's no feedback. No, there's no feedback and there's no way of proposing a change without taking a chance on your whole career. It is fundamental. Let's do a, a thought experiment of what would happen in both of the cases. If I cannot tell you that I believe that your glasses fit you badly because there's going to be repression, I will not be able to communicate the feedback or the information that I th think would be interesting to you to know. It's not as if I consider that your glasses don't fit you in any kind of way, but it's just that in every interaction, in order to communicate something, there's transaction costs. There's how much I value the increase in your well-being in order to be able to communicate it. You could maybe take it wrongly so that you will get offended. So I don't want to offend you. I should take into account both of the sides. One side, how much I care about you and about your well-being and about your aesthetics. And in the other side, how much I care about the offense that I might generate in you due to the comment. So if you add the non-freedom of speech, you're adding costs to the negative side, to the costs of the transaction. So I think that that should be reduced the most possible and people should have faith in the society. Yeah, well, I think people should have faith that, that those who talk freely contribute, whether they're right or wrong. You don't have to be right to exercise freedom of expression. You can be wrong, even plainly wrong. You can be in error. You can argue a mathematically untenable proposition, but you still have to be able to do it. In science, for instance, it's obvious that you have to be able to discuss incorrect hypotheses. You have to be able to make an incorrect hypothesis, and it's disproved ultimately. But freedom of express expression and, and freedom of science requires that you be able to make such a hypothesis and experiment to see whether it's true or not. I think that the central tenet of freedom of speech is that if we locked our morality or our moral progress or our scientific knowledge to what we consider right now to be correct, we know that that will not be considered correct in the future. So we'll be, we will be locking ourselves to a suboptimal situation, which requires of flexibility in the future. And knowing that we are stupid and not capable of getting to the perfection in moral and knowledge terms, we should allow the system to have some flexibility. Yes, absolutely. And all you have to do is look at the society 60 years ago. 
homosexuality was a crime. There's still an extramarital sex was still an issue. People were quite a bit more religious, at least in the Christian world, because the Muslim world has become very religious now. People believed in moral hypotheses that uh, are now generally discredited. It was a very different world. But you had to be able to say, I don't, I don't agree. And in case you cannot, we will be locked in our current considerations. Yeah. There is a, a name for this called presentism. People who believe that the present is the perfect culmination of world civilization. So they judge everything in terms of present day morality. They will look at the world in 1900 through the prism of today and say it was a terrible crime that they didn't recognize the equality of homosexuals or they were primitive and not, not knowing some of the scientific things. They didn't, it was a terrible thing that they did because they didn't know, for instance, that exposure to radium would cause cancer. But you have to consider the world in 1900 through the prisms of their world, of what it looked like and what appeared right at that time. Now, of course, you can make judgments. Historical judgments can be made. But I think presentism is an extremely dangerous thing because it imposes the present moment as the ultimate best solution to everything. I see many similarities. Please tell me if you consider my theory wrong. I see many similarities between presentism, as you explained it, and the ecological or environmentalist movement. The central thesis is that human impact on the environment or on nature is incorrect and that how it was before our impact or the current situation is the optimal so that no future impact or movement is correct. That obsession with the static nature of what is currently the case is really similar to what you were explaining about presentism. Absolutely. And, the, you know, the ecological movement or the, that movement, it can change drastically. Perhaps tomorrow there will be a new form of energy that will be invented, that will become easy and cheap, and all, of that we've, all that we've been saying will become irrelevant. Perhaps we're going to have to cut down drastically on all sorts of things, on travel and on, on everything else. But to take today as the ultimate paradigm, is, as the model for everything, is obviously your own view. It's naive, knowing that there was no previous moment that was, per that was perfect. How is it that this one is? Yeah, well, that's right. You know, all you have to do is look at uh, how other people were convinced that they had discovered the truth in life. You know, in the 1930s, people took Hitler's theories, uh, race theories, seriously. They would debate it. They, they, they would say that the, he, he may have a point here, he may have a point there. That was all totally wrong. But from the point of view of in the 1930s, they had that idea. But fortunately, they didn't have total presentism. So there were people who didn't ac accept that. Today, when we try to judge all of the past through the glasses of 2022, we risk losing all freedom and all flexibility. We risk not being able to progress. In a way, one of the great works of literature, Goethe's Faust, the devil asks Faust, Mephistopheles asks Faust, or explains to Faust, that the minute he will be able to claim his soul, as soon as Faust says, stop time, this moment is perfect. If you believe this moment is perfect, then you're losing your moral value. So that was what Goethe said in 1800. The road to hell is to believe that this moment is perfect. Because the evidence that Goethe was basing his statement on is that that same analysis had been done before with no successful outcome. Yes. Well, Goethe was basing himself on the Enlightenment. He was basing himself on a period of time where they did value thought and humanism, uh, internationalism, and things of that sort. But he did also understand that there's nothing more dangerous than complacency and a belief in one's perfection. Don't let perfection be the enemy of good. Yes, uh, perfection is uh, something we can never attain. And we always have to be able to criticize the present. There's no rule that should be 
stated in order to praise the current governance or current things that are being considered correct. Like if I go to a manifestation that, that's a feminist manifestation or to, a, a, to an anti-racist manifestation, there's no one doing explicit comments against it. It's just 100% beard to signaling. I'm not saying that the opposite theories are correct. I'm just saying that there's no one supporting them explicitly. No, but what they do is they repeat slogan and sometimes very empty ones. They're terribly concerned because somebody calls some group the wrong name. If you use the N-word or do whatever uh, that thing. But they're not so concerned about the fact that, say, 50% of the inmates of American prisons are still members of that group. They're concerned only by appearances, by everybody showing I'm also in agreement without doing anything about it. That's virtue signaling. Yeah, virtue signaling. And, and we have it in Canada and Native Matters, where everybody is going around about lamenting the injustices. But in the meantime, there's still no drinking water on many reserves. There is still no medical uh, supplies in many of them. And people are not that, uh, concerned about that. They're only concerned about showing their own concern, showing their own indignation. Yeah. What do you think of this quote? I would like to know your thoughts about this quote. The demand for racism outstrips the supply for it. <laughs> I've never thought of that, but uh, yes, there is something to it. There are all sorts of people who want to, who need it in order to, to demonstrate their, their virtue, even in places where it doesn't exist. Yeah, exactly. Because your business is sustained in the existence of racism or the patriarchy. And in the moment that you are like, oh, okay, there's no more patriarchy or racism here in the West, or there's marginal racism and patriarchy. Let's go yeah. to somewhere else where there is racism. No group ever wants to admit that its claims have been met in full. Any group that's trying to get redress, once it gets the redress, is still going to want to stay together and get more, because otherwise it means we have no more business. So you will never get a group to admit that, for instance, a particular type of racism no longer exists. In the same way that Apple would never admit, hey, this model that we built last year was perfect, let's just stop it, we have progressed enough, let's now help Samsung improve. Yeah, people don't accept. But one of the things about the um, sort of anti-discrimination campaigns is that they never end because the groups never agree that the discrimination has ended. So an obvious example would be where uh, the Jewish community was clearly a victim of serious discrimination, couldn't be, uh, didn't get into university, couldn't be a judge, couldn't be a minister, couldn't be anything else. Now, all of that is clearly untrue, but they keep talking about the increase in anti-Semitism. Why? Because somebody defaces a grave or writes a slogan, uh, graffiti on a building. Of course, you can't stop an idiot from writing graffiti on a building. There will always be that. But when the big issues of whether you can have a reasonable career, equality in, in the real sense of the word has been settled, you still keep fighting because there are still things that you're not satisfied with. And it's not, I gave that as an example, it'll apply to every group. Every group that's ever fought rightly for certain things. For instance, trade unions were wonderful, necessary. They were something that had to be done in the 19th century in order to get justice for the working man. But today there are often excessive demands, demands that bring down little businesses or whatever, because they can't see that the basic power lines have shifted. And again, I think unions are still very important and they still have a very important function. But if you like, the injustices of the 19th century have been largely palliated in that way. I think this is perfectly resembled by a quote by Upton Sinclair that, quote, it's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on not understanding it. Yes, absolutely. And when it comes to unions, of course, there's one problem because, you know, I, I noted that it's been palliated and things are better. But they've been getting a little worse again during the last 20 or 30 years of neoliberalism so that the argument in favor of trade unions might 
uh, resembled some of the 19th century ones. But then again, it shows you the oscillations. You can't freeze the truth. The same arguments that might have been true in 1820 were not so true in 1970 and are true again. I know that there's a big movement supporting the redistribution of wealth in terms of the West is rich, the rest of the world is mostly poor. Let's move the richness or the wealth of these people that are rich towards those who are not in a way of maximizing equity or whatever the definition is. Okay, there's a movement there. And there's a lot of overlap between the people who support redistribution of wealth and the people who are anti-racist or feminist. How can that overlap exist between those communities if people who are feminist do not support redistribution of feminism across the world? Well, I think they should. They would support redistribution. You see, it's, it's very difficult to, to argue this point because, as you know, on the one hand, certain countries are poorer. On the other hand, women are treated very badly there. So if you're talking about redistribution, say, in favor of Africa, then you're giving up some of our, unless you're willing to, to, to be colonialist and say we're going to redistribute on condition that you accept our rules about gender equality and racial equality and so on, you run into paradoxes. I think redistribution is necessary. I think we have to find some ways of redistributing. But I do not believe that simply some sort of naive form of taking and giving will work. If you do that, first of all, much of it will be wasted. Secondly, there are not people ready to exploit it there. So you've got to have a plan that is a longer term plan, which does redistribute very effectively. One of the things that we have to understand is that there's going to be massive emigration from the third world. If Africa is going to contain half of the world's population by the year 2100, then there's going to be a lot of emigration. Some of the redistribution will be done by immigration. You're right. People who are immigrants, they typically send money to their families back in their old country. They're better off. They come in and they, they, they earn Western wages. So the redistribution between the people who are doing very well right now and the people who are in other countries may take place in many different forms, one of which will be classical redistribution aid. Another will be redistribution of knowledge so they can do it for themselves. They can farm effectively. They can have effective uh, policies. Another one may be immigration. Are there examples of previous successes nationwide in which a nation got prosperous or rich through redistribution? Uh, I'm sure you, if you go, will go through history, you will find redistribution. East Germany made serious gains from West Germany. Now, East Germany was never desperately poor. Life in East Germany in the 1970s and 80s was, by world standards, quite decent. I mean, the, 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 the food that you got and the, the clothing and, and the culture of life was possibly better than in the West. But it was poorer than West Germany, and the redistribution did work there to some extent. Yeah, but there, there was a lot of cohesion culturally. People were more... That, that doesn't necessarily happen now when people from the Middle East come migrate to Europe and unfortunately they don't get assimilated. Well, that's one of the things that you can't say anymore. I believe that assimilation has much to recommend it. If you say it, you get crucified. You get attacked for colonialism and so on. I do think that when massive migration takes place, it's not unreasonable to expect assimilation. Assimilation is not the adoption, blind adoption of uh, uh, somebody else's culture. It means maybe the fusion of the cultures. Each group contributes something to the culture that emerges. But obviously, the group that was there before is the major part of it. So I do not think, I think multiculturalism is an error. And English Canada is making a terrible error in multiculturalism. It, you should not keep separate groups in one society. You should go on the model of England and France. England had uh, Celts, uh, Romans, Anglo-Saxons, Scandinavians, Norman French, and they all welded together into an English language and an English world. France had 
Celts, uh, Romans, and then Germanic tribes that became, the, the Franks were a Germanic tribe. And uh, that model is, I think, better than the model of the groups remaining separate everywhere and the notion of identity. But of course, my belief in freedom of expression makes me admit that people are entitled to take an identity position. Yeah, maybe my term of assimilation is not the correct one. Maybe the correct one would be acceptance. Those immigrants are unfortunately not accepted into societies. I think the perhaps better ter best term would be integration. Yeah. But total integration, which includes necessarily, and this is the real key to it, intermarriage. So that the next generation is no longer one group only. Mm, yeah, but how will you convince a Middle Eastern man to marry a blonde Norwegian woman? I don't think you have much trouble with that. The problem is how will you convince him to give his daughter to a blonde Norwegian man? Uh, Because the, that's where they're more possessive. But I think you will. In a, I believe that it's not our consciousness that determines how we live, but our economic conditions. And if If the people are economically making their living in the same way, then they will merge. It's based on Marx. The idea that we ultimately are determined to some extent by our material conditions and the means of production. So that if you bring people in and merge them economically, I think you will find that they uh, merge in other ways too. The reason why, for instance, in France right now, the integration of uh, the Muslim minority is not going as well as the integration, say, of other people 30 years ago went, or 40 years ago, is because there's 30% unemployment among the young people in those suburbs because they are not part of the great French economy, because they don't go to the great schools, and so on. So I think in the, some do, some do, and I have every reason to believe that they will ultimately, but I think the... Uh, Economic integration, the social economic integration go together. Hmm. So, in a way, Marx was partially correct. It's not that we are 100% determined by our physical means, but partially we are. Uh, partially. Uh, look, in, in the very long run, run it may not, may not be correct in the sense that in the very long run, it may be physical things. If a comet hurts the Earth, hits the Earth, then it's all over. And Marx or no Marx. But I think Marx's vision of uh, the crucial role played by economics in uh, the development of history is largely correct. Now, that shouldn't lead us to naive economics. Uh, in other words, to believe that everything was the cause of economic factors. An obvious example is hist history is not, unless you believe in total determinism, molecular determinism, that everything is determined, we just don't know. But obviously, history could have gone a different way in detail. Napoleon could have won Waterloo. All it would have meant If Blucher's army had missed, Napoleon would have beaten Wellington. Would that have changed the ultimate development of capitalism and socialism? I don't think so. I think even if Napoleon had been emperor, the basic developments of capitalism and its opponents would have taken place in the same way. In the same way, for instance, I don't know if you're aware of the fact that this today is a dangerous topic to, 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 to broach. In 1864, The war, civil war was going so badly that people were thinking that Lincoln was going to lose the election in 1864. And if he had lost to McClellan, McClellan wanted to make peace and allow the South to continue. That could have happened. There were a bunch of victories in the summer of 1864 that swung the election in favor of Lincoln. But you can imagine that it might have happened. But I don't think there would be slavery today. I don't think we would have a slave economy because it makes no sense. So you think that there's a more solid substrate in history that is not dependent on luck. There's something going on behind that's more solid. Yeah. In, in the middle term. And put it in a different way. Suppose Queen Elizabeth I had woken up one morning and said, I don't like what's happening. How am I going to change 
the world for the future. She couldn't have done anything. She could not have stopped the development. She could have said no exploration for the next 20 years. So it would have been slower and maybe New France would have gone ahead rather than New England. But in the short run things can be different. But the middle run is largely economic, and that's where Marx was correct. The very long run may be physical, astronomical. We don't know what the long run. The long run can destroy humanity or not destroy humanity without regard to economics. I know you have been opposed to Bill 96. Could you give yes. a, a bit of an explanation over what that was for the listeners who are not from Canada? Well, Bill 96 is a law that wants to make French, I think, the only language in Quebec. There's no doubt that French is the official language of Quebec, and I agree with that. I live in French in many ways. Uh, there's no doubt that French needs some protection, and that's why you can't just allow people to go to English school as they wish. Why? Why does it need protection? Well, the schooling. You have to make sure that people continue to go to French schools. Well, why is that? Because otherwise, French might disappear. Oh. In a context of North America, if uh, everybody goes to English school, it may well be that French will no longer be of much use. However, Bill 96 is in many ways an attack on individual rights, on the right to service, for instance, to this English minority, whether it's in medical matters or in education or in, in justice. It's a law that wants to devalue the contribution of, it wants to make Quebec only French. I don't think it can be. I don't think you can be only French in North America, but I also don't think it's the right idea. I think individual freedom requires that we keep this. Montreal is in that way a wonderful place where you can live in both French and English. You have to protect French. You have to have French school rules, but at the same time, there is no reason to pass laws that restrict the use of English. Bureaucratize, allow a language bureaucracy to, to oppress people, to go into businesses, to go into all sorts of institutions and keep verifying how much English is being spoken or how much French is being spoken. And why is it that then English does not need that protection in the schools? Well, I think English may need some protection in terms of subsidies for English cultural events and so on. But English right now has the force of North America behind it. It does have, we live in a context of North America, New York, Chicago, Toronto. Therefore, it is unlikely that English would cease to be spoken at all. But that could happen with French. It could if there were no French schools. There are some examples historically. In Wales, most people spoke Welsh and not English. Then they passed the Education Act in the 1857. Education was in English. Two generations later, most people spoke English, but no Welsh. Oh, wow. In Manitoba and Louisiana, they passed laws making all education English, and French became very marginal as a phenomenon. But that, those are the, those examples. But on the other hand, and this is where Quebec is wrong, there are no examples of a country which had a school system that was free and obligatory in that language, losing the language. Not one example. You don't lose a language. And languages survive situations where they, uh, you know, Danish has survived side by side with German. German is a far more powerful language, a far more uh, populous uh, nation. But Danish survives. But then schools in Copenhagen are in Danish. In order to justify the intervention of the government, to go against the will of the people, because I think that the intervention of the government in many occasions it is justified when a tragedy of the commons occurs. There, the government should force everyone to act in a way that's good for the collective. But in terms of languages, I'm super skeptical of the justified role of the government. Why is it that if people would not want to choose French voluntarily, is the government justified to force people to learn in French? Well, I think that's the fundamental question. I answer yes, I think a state can choose its language. When you also say that they're trying to force something against the will of the people, it's not quite so. The majority of the people are in favor of saving French. Just that individual people, for one reason or another, often opt 
for English. But there is clearly a consensus in this society that people want to speak French and want to be able to speak French. There is also a consensus, which our government doesn't want to deal with, that most people want to know how to speak English as well. Most people want to have an opportunity to be French, but integrated in North America. But uh, I don't think protection of French is being forced. And I think when you look around the world, countries will run in their own language. And I don't think it's a matter of that, that people cannot legislate. I notice, for instance, that Poland, which doesn't have many minorities, has a language law saying that certain contracts have to be done in, in, in Polish. And if you ask for information from the Polish Office of Civil Status, they'll require that you do it in Polish, translate it if you want. And they're not the only one. In many European countries, there's language legislation. For instance, is it fair for German and Italian to be taught in their formal, not in dialect, but in either High German or Tuscan. Why can't you have Sicilian for everything, for uh, schools in Sicily, or, or Bavarian or Swiss Deutsch for schools in Switzerland? The answer is there are certain decisions that are necessary. People have to have a common language, and which the common language or common languages, because it's not necessarily one, are, is a matter for legislation. But what you're not allowed to do is restrict freedom of expression. For instance, when Quebec tried to say you can't put up a sign in English, that was contrary to freedom of expression. And that was struck by the courts then. But I think that when you are dedicating public resources to the subsidy of another language that's not the one that people individually would choose, even if that's a tragedy of the commons in which I agree with you, people individually and egoistically choose to not learn French because it's better for them, because that time they, they can invest it in something else. But everyone agrees in that they want everyone else to learn French because they value the culture. But in this case, in which the subsidies are being carried towards French, don't you think that the amount of investment per knowledge or scientific development, whatever metric you want to use, if you compare metrics in academic accomplishment or professionalism or knowledge of specific things. You, you might know this example in law. How competent are students from Quebec in law in comparison to the students of law from other regions in which French is not subsidized so people can invest less time in learning languages because they only have to learn one? I think they're probably just as competent, maybe even more competent, because language develops the mind. I have no, no studies of it. I'm, I'm just speculating. Uh, but that would apply to all social programs. You know, some people don't want Medicare. If you're very wealthy, you can do better on your own. Some people may not want laws about zoning. If you own a property, you'd like to zone it in the best way to sell it, and not in the best way for you not to zone it green or anything like it. But nevertheless, these are legitimate objects of legislation. It has to be done fairly. It has to be done decently. But it, you cannot argue that individual decisions made on the basis of self-interest are the only legitimate decisions in society. Okay, so even... One, even if that would lead to an inefficiency in terms of less capacity to learn all these things, it would be justified. And two, that's not proven. It might not be that people lose efficiency in learning other things when they learn a second language. I think you can argue that the more you learn, the more efficiency you gain. It's not proved at all. The fact that you put in 10 more hours in, into something else rather than learning a language doesn't mean that you become more proficient. Okay. For instance, learning languages clearly exercises your memory in a way which you have to remember two, three, four words for everything. You do end up probably more competent. I would love to see the statistics uh, study done, but no one wants to... There are studies done both ways. There are some people who say children get confused if you bring them up in two languages, and nationalists usually believe that. In Quebec, they'll tell you you shouldn't be learning English until high school. And there are other studies which say that you're better off if you start out with two languages or three languages, and for every study, you'll find a counter-study. Yeah, but I, I was referring more to the fact, to just economical, pragmatic terms. 
if you invest less time in doing things and more time in doing some other things, if that thing is not a language, you will be more capable of being a professional engineer. So that's that's the thing that I want. I would like to see the statistics about. Are, are better engineers? I, I'm not sure that you'll find that. Okay. But let's uh, let's add something else. It would be a more sufficient, proficient society if we didn't invest money into minority activities. For instance, opera. Opera is of interest to 2% of the population. We spend considerable amounts putting on Verdi and Wagner. Uh, same for Shakespeare or whatever, uh, classical music. All these things, you could argue, you could be more efficient in society if you didn't spend all these, all these funds for what are truly minority views. And yet I think they make everybody better off. It is a useful thing for the possibility of going to the opera to be present in our society. It's another tragedy of the commons in which no one wants to assume the personal cost, but everyone wants to be part of a society in which opera is a popular thing. But if you went to people and said you can each have $100 back as a check from the government, if we cancel those programs, they would possibly opt to get their $100. Yeah, exactly. And the same thing, I think, happens with French. No one wants to learn it individually, or not many people. You are right in saying that uh, when you impose a language as an official language, there, are pe there is a cost to it and nobody wants to bear it personally. But I think in Quebec there is a general consensus that they want French to be defended. But there is also a consensus that they want to be able to learn English. And the, the government is unable to deal, to reconcile the two consensuses. Okay, now changing a bit of topics, going to more towards the law side. Do you think lawyers and people working in the law sector are incentivized to complicate things in a way, to maximize their own business? Well, it's always been that way. In the Middle Ages, in the British lawyers, the barrister had very complicated Latin formula that nobody could understand except them. And that was a way of maintaining their business and procedure and so on. There are, of course, ways in which these things are being done. And, you know, the sort of constant audits of everything and verifications and the lawyer comes in and checks and finds this is difficult and that is difficult. But on the other hand, you might argue that in a complex society with a lot of regulations, rules, etc., you do need that sort of assistance. So it's not a simple answer. But yes, the world of the big law firms helping big clients does maximize both the profits of the law firms and the profits of the big clients. The other thing where lawyers are making tremendous amounts of money today for very little for anybody else is class actions. If you find that Ford has uh, put in the wrong type of windshield wiper worth $20 and there's a class action, a lawyer makes $10 million and each person gets $20, it's obvious that it's the lawyers who have benefited from the uh, operation. But it's much more complicated than that because there are real gains from legal advice. But that doesn't automatically discard the fact that it could be more simple with the same benefits. Absolutely. It could be more simple, just like laws could be more simple. You could have a much simpler income tax act. You could have a much simpler criminal code. The criminal code is shameful right now. It's becoming so complicated that reading the criminal code practically requires that you hire a lawyer to read it, whereas the criminal code is something that should be so simple that any citizen who wants to find out how to stay out of jail would be able to read it by himself. I think this is the case because if laws are complex enough, someone who's inconvenient for the government, the government will always be able to use a law. They will always be able to find something on anybody. There is nobody. That is why, for instance, many people, when you argue for charter protections and things like that, people will say, if you didn't do anything, you shouldn't be worried. That's not true. Anybody can be accused. Anybody can, be, can actually find himself in violation of something. And anybody especially in this world in which an accusation, we talked about that earlier, an accusation destroys you or a conviction for a minor offense destroys you and follows you, anybody can be in trouble. Right now, we clearly live in a world in which a public servant, an actor or a professor is totally destroyed 
if without any other evidence, a woman gets up and says, he touched me 20 years ago, and I didn't consent. Oh, wow. No, it's true. It's true that these things are happening right now. I'm not at present advocating not looking into it or anything like it. What I am saying is that anybody who committed something or didn't commit something might find himself before a court. And in other words, it's, it's not true that if you're innocent, you have nothing to worry about. And laws should be simple because anybody can be accused of something. Do you think presumption of innocence is not applied? Well, whether it's applied or not, it's never entirely clear. And many things depend on proof of fact. And anybody might be in need of help. Also, all sorts of things are acts which can be in good faith, but accidental, can also be fraudulent or illegal. So somebody who, for instance, has failed to file something for years and years and years may not be guilty of anything. He may be guilty of stupidity, but, but not of a crime. But in that case, he needs lawyers. He needs rules. He needs protections. You can't be, you can't be forced to speak against you. And the pre presumption of innocence is an extremely important thing. If there is a doubt, then you're not guilty. Another super important concept in law is legal certainty. When you don't know what the outcome is going to be based on the laws, arbitrariness is invited to the party. And when arbitrariness is invited... Well, absolute chaos reigns. What do you think of legal certainty? I think legal certainty is a major concern. But I also think legal certainty can be overvalued. There are situations in which you may prefer to bend legal certainty. For one thing, legal certainty depends on rules, hard and fast rules that are easily defined. But rules are made by the powerful and the wealthy. And therefore, a judge might need some imagination in order to decide for the little guy against the bank. And so certainty is only one of the values. It is one of the values, but it's only one of them. Justice is another. Fairness is another. Redistribution is another. So you, what you have to have is a situation where many of these values can be applied together and modified one with reference to the other. Why would that bias against the little guy exist in the writing of the laws, but not in the interpretation of the laws? If those judges have also been selected by the powerful and the rich people... Absolutely. Uh, judges are not the Robin Hoods. However, there is less control. What happens is when you appoint somebody and you say he doesn't have to run again, there are all sorts of things that can come out. You're perfectly right. Those who are powerful influence society in every field, in, in, in the judicial, in the legislative, in the executive. But I think the judicial leaves the most room for uh, a certain amount of uh, creative equalization. Okay. As long as we're not too rigid about the certainty. What establishes what a human right is? Who is in charge of imposing or determining what a human right is? First of all, there are legislatures that do that, or the United Nations, international legislatures or national ones, people who write charters. It depends on the spirit of the times. But we have to ask ourselves perhaps a question that Kant would have liked. Would we want every person in every circumstances to benefit from this particular principle? We have to act in such a way that everybody could always act on the same basis. So we have to ask ourselves, is it acceptable to me or to everybody in our society that people be imprisoned without trial? And I think the answer would be no. Is it acceptable that they be forced to marry against their will? The answer will be no, and so on. So every society has a list of things that are not acceptable, but you have to make a distinction between what socially creates a civil right, and how you legislate it. If you legislate it, you legislate it the normal way. Constitutions, founders of constitutions, legislatures, and international legislatures. The General Assembly, for instance, the General Assembly of the United Nations has a certain power to declare international law. Who is responsible for the violation of a human right? Well, the person who violated it bears responsibility, and uh, presumably it should be justiciable. You should be able to get redress before the courts. That's the purpose of our courts. It, it isn't always possible. And, of course, history is full of unfair trials and so on. All of Christianity is based 
on an unfair execution. So it is true that it isn't always successful, but all of society is. All societies should strive to have human rights applied. And what are the apparatus used to impose those rules? Well, the courts, the constitutions, custom. If you have a society which is generally where people are by custom, gentle, and so on, you, you'll have more, more of the rules respected. You could list all sorts of things. All activities in human society are permeated by a notion of fundamental rights. Okay. To conclude, freedom of speech allows and is the only thing that allows autocorrection. And without it, we are condemned to perish. Julius, where can people find more about you, about your work, about your company? On the, on the net, Google, I, don't, I have no idea. I never look myself up. Okay, yeah. I, I know that your daughter, I think, manages your Twitter account. Yes. So I will leave your Twitter account in the description just in case people want to check that out and your web page. Yeah. yeah, and you'll, you'll get my daughter's comment. Okay, perfect. Thank you. It, it's been nice talking to you, Ulysses. Oh, bye-bye.